Land degradation is a major global challenge to a sustainable future. The conversion of natural areas to agriculture can significantly contribute to land degradation if agricultural practices are inappropriate. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that land degradation costs $40 billion each year. Agriculture is the most widespread form of human-environment interaction. It provides employment to more people and uses more soil and water than any other human activity. Farmers therefore constitute the largest group of natural resource managers on the planet. A pervasive challenge to efforts to reduce the contribution of agriculture to land degradation is that practices known to reduce or reverse degradation are not widely adopted by farmers. Is this because of limited relevance, limited credibility or limited legitimacy? A practice might not be relevant if it conflicts with farmers' other interests or has constraints such as high labour requirements. It may lack credibility if the evidence for it working is not convincing. And it may lack legitimacy if it is seen as something imposed on farmers from outside. A recent study highlights that wide-scale adoption of practices to sustainably increase agricultural production and maintain the provision of other ecosystem services requires three key issues to be addressed. The first is to recognise the importance of fine-scale variation in the social, economic and ecological context and how this creates a need for local adaptation of practices. The second is recognising the importance of appropriate service delivery mechanisms, markets and institutional contexts that support the practices. Third is to adopt a co-learning approach amongst research, development and private sector actors that embeds appropriate research designs in the scaling process. The co-learning paradigm builds on previous integrated systems frameworks but goes further by embedding research centrally within development practice. This video describes an approach that has proved useful when implementing the co-learning paradigm. We have found the participatory trials design workshops, partrides workshops, a practical approach for putting the co-learning paradigm into practice. The general objectives of partrides workshops are to develop participatory skills while also designing relevant on-farm trials to evaluate options that address farmer household demands. For example, demands related to food security and nutrition, to fodder for animals, to fuel wood for cooking, to materials required in some agricultural systems like poles used for climbing beans, or to manure and milk production. The evaluation of relevant options takes into account the variations in site characteristics defined by the context. Important variation in site characteristics that might influence the value of alternative options can be ecological. For example, floodplain agriculture is quite different from that on sloping terrain. Similarly, challenges and opportunities in landscapes with high plant cover are different from those where plant cover is low. Some locations have specific problems, such as these shallow rocky soils resulting from their volcanic origin. Important variation that might influence the value of alternative options can also be social. Farmers' circumstances are an important part of the context. For example, challenges and opportunities are not the same for farmers with a small farm producing maize mainly for self-consumption, and farmers closely linked to markets, or those with additional sources of income, like those owning cattle for milk production, with woodlots in addition to crop fields, or farmers involved in social networks or strongly influenced by local and national policies. The evaluation of relevant options for different contexts requires the effective use of participatory research tools and sound statistical design. An important principle is that there need be no conflict between the requirements of good participation and high quality research. Existing information is collected before the Partrides workshops take place. This includes historical data and past research data, such as information from socio-economic surveys collected in the target area. This provides an initial idea of past and existing challenges and potential drivers of change. The Partrides workshop is composed of two phases. 
The initial knowledge sharing phase uses tools from the Impact S participatory methodological guide to systematically build the conditions for an effective knowledge sharing process. This leads to the co-development of viable options that blend local knowledge and experience with scientific knowledge. The knowledge sharing phase is followed by the trials design phase, where the viable options identified in the first phase become central components of the design of trials to evaluate their performance under different contexts and pharma circumstances so that usable options can be identified as candidates for scaling up. The knowledge sharing phase uses the Impact S approach and methodological guide that is a result of more than a decade of South-South collaboration between Latin America and Africa. Impact S was designed to facilitate pharma-centered approaches that integrate local knowledge into agricultural decision making. It addresses potential limitations of relevance, credibility and legitimacy. The conceptual basis of the Impact S methodological approach is that local knowledge and scientific knowledge share a number of common core concepts. However, each knowledge system has gaps that in many cases can be complemented by each other. New research for development efforts should rely on an expanded shared knowledge that blends local and scientific knowledge that is more relevant, credible and legitimate to pharma communities. Partride's workshops start with several group dynamic exercises used to build the knowledge sharing space while learning from each other's expectations and backgrounds. I'm slim and cool. <laughs> This is followed by activities to develop a common understanding of the systems approach and to foster teamwork. Embracing a systems approach in agricultural research for development starts with a focus on the farm as the smallest decision-making unit by identifying its boundaries, key systems components and their interactions. Crops, trees, livestock and soil are identified as the most frequent components found on farm and the interactions among them identified by numbers from 1 to 6. Here, the workshop participants identify the positive or negative interactions between each possible pair of components. Workshop participants are then asked the question of how the management of different components could reduce the negative interactions or trade-offs and enhance the positive interactions, synergies and complementarities that have been identified. An aim of this step is to make sure everyone is thinking about the farm as a system and not only about individual components. The preparatory phase is concluded by learning the Impact S tools to identify, classify and prioritise local indicators of soil quality. This activity becomes another opportunity to foster teamwork while learning participatory skills. A first group visit to the study areas and farming community hosting workshop activities allows participants and local leaders to meet each other and to make final plans for joint activities during the week. On the second day of the workshop, a knowledge sharing activity is organised to use the Impact S tools to learn from farmers' knowledge and experience on soil fertility management. Farmers representing different communities from the study area meet at one of those locations to participate in a knowledge sharing exercise with workshop trainees. It's organised in working groups and guided by Impact S participatory tools to identify, classify and prioritise local indicators of soil quality. The synthesis matrix brings together the results from all different working groups and generates a list of local indicators of soil quality in order of importance for the study area. Local indicators are an essential ingredient for the integration step, which is summarized in the integration matrix. The prioritized list of local indicators of soil quality are first related to scientific indicators of soil quality and then classified as indicators of modifiable or permanent soil properties. 
Indicators receiving higher priority are usually associated with the most pressing problems. Linking indicators to problems is critical. Participatory soil mapping is useful for further understanding of farmers' perceptions of soil resources and degradation on their farms. Recognising the soil degradation of different areas of farmers' fields allows focus on areas where problems are most acute. For example, soils which are non-responsive to fertiliser application, thus contributing to relevance. This will guide the location of participatory trials, making the information they generate most credible for the problem of restoring soil health. Impact S tools provide an entry point to the co-development of options illustrated here with soil as an example. Other farm components, such as crops, livestock and trees, could also be used as entry points to the co-development of other options. Trainees conduct group discussions to define management options for three input use capacity scenarios – no input, low input and medium to high input – under conditions of low, medium or high soil quality, which are captured in the management options matrix for indicators of soil properties that are modifiable through management. Agroecological management principles are provided to guide integrated soil fertility management options that reduce input use dependence as well as increase the efficiency of input use. Consistent with earlier activities looking at system component interactions, our overall goal is to co-develop management options that minimise trade-offs and maximise synergies and complementarities. An example of this is the use of Caliranja hedges for erosion control, where the management practice of periodic pruning reduces tree competition with crops and at the same time provides feed for animals. The list of viable management options will be the output of the last activity of the knowledge sharing phase and a key input for phase two of the Partrides workshop, which is concerned with the design of trials to be implemented in the farmer's fields. The three conditions of relevance, credibility and legitimacy have been shown to be critical for effective linking of knowledge to action which results in the adoption of more appropriate practices. This can be simply put as doing the right thing, doing it well and being recognised as the right people to do it. Partrides workshops aim to address this challenge through a knowledge sharing process that identifies relevant objectives and questions, uses methods and designs which are credible and brings together and builds effective communication channels between farmers, researchers and other stakeholders. Participation is also central to the trial's design phase and takes place at each of six steps. During the development of research questions and objectives, participation is key in defining priorities. There is no single approach, but rather a tailored approach, developed through consultation and negotiation with participants. Details such as which treatment will be used in trials on each farm are negotiated by the participants. Trials are participatory, designed to be managed by farmers, and simple measurements and assessments can be done by farmers. The analysis and interpretation of results is jointly done with farmers, researchers and others. The planning of next steps also includes the participation of all actors involved in the trial design and management process. A key challenge in the design of participatory trials is reconciling the local needs of participating farmers with researchers' interest in producing generalizable information, using tools for effective participation without forgetting principles of good experimental design helps with this. The context in which an intervention is used will have a large impact on its performance and on the relative performance of alternatives. The context variables that matter may be ecological, social or economic, and they can vary at every scale from national down to within farm and household. We describe this as option by context interaction and have elaborated the concept elsewhere. Wide variation across farms, communities and landscapes in the performance of interventions is the norm rather than the exception. No single recommendation will be appropriate for everywhere and everyone. 
So we use a good fits approach. Good fits are options and practices that, based on our current understanding of ecological principles and context, we predict will be useful to farmers. Variation in performance of a recommended practice is a risk for farmers, as they cannot be sure what its effect will be. Understanding the variation can reduce risk. The good fits get better. Simple, well-planned experiments can provide that understanding. If research based on experiments is to be successful, then you must pay careful attention to design of the trials, particularly trials done with farmers. By design, we do not only mean the statistical components, such as number of replicates and measurements, but the plan of the whole process. Good experimental design starts with good research questions, which must be clear, focused and non-trivial. They should be questions that must be answered to make progress, linked to a hypothesis and answerable within the scope of the project. And it must be possible to answer them through a trial or experiment. If they are also of interest beyond the project, so much the better. Workshop participants are divided into working groups and asked to develop one or two research questions, which are later collected, integrated with similar questions to avoid redundancy, and compiled into a single list. At this stage, it's not important to get the wording right. You need to make sure you have research questions that will really help make progress with a project. Many of the most practical questions are likely to relate to the interactions between options and contexts. In this example, the interaction is between the option, amending fertilizer with biochar, and the state of soil degradation. It was posed as a response to the problem of soils that are non-responsive to fertilizers. Think about systems component interactions. Useful research questions are unlikely to concern one component only without reference to the rest of the system. There are no recipes for producing experimental designs and certainly no catalogue of designs to choose from. Understanding the principles of core design elements is important. These include objectives and hypotheses, experimental treatments, knowledge of social, economic, ecological context, study units, at what scale the experiment is to be conducted, means of ensuring randomization, ways of controlling variation, clarity on the responses to be measured and who they will be measured by, and the role of farmers as co-developers of the trial and key contributors to interpretation of results. As an example, when experimenting on soil fertility management in a landscape like this, experimental design needed to be tailored to capture key sources of variation. These were both across the hillsides and across each terrace. In this context, where different farmers crop each terrace, the design used transects up and down the slope. Each one included experimental plots in three terraces or farms to assess the impact of position on the slope as a source of context variation. We also considered the impact of position across each terrace as another source of variation. Hence this situation required a landscape trial design approach that builds on variation both across the terrace and across the hillside. This design was well adapted to the task, but does not appear in any design textbook. After specifying the research questions and objectives, start the design by outlining the approach to be used, and then review what you have. In the Partridge workshops, we outline the approach with a simple framework with six components, and then review it for consistency and coherence. After reviewing the approach, move on to deciding details and review again. At this stage, it may be necessary to change the approach or even go back and modify the research question if, for example, the trial seems to be impractical for some reason. Additional review questions help to challenge the robustness of the trial design before establishing it in the field. For instance, will the trial produce information needed by farmers? Will it contribute to research knowledge? Is the approach realistic? Is it practical within the current situation and project? What could go wrong? What are the most challenging details to sort out? The next step is to prepare a written protocol for the trial, for which we use a checklist. The reasons for having a detailed written protocol are first, that it can be shared for comment and improvement. It provides a common understanding of the trial for research team members. It also becomes a record of what was specifically done, something that is needed when interpreting trial results. 
It helps to keep focus on the specific research objectives and steps, something which is particularly important in projects with several different research and development activities occurring at the same time in the same area. The key elements of the protocol checklist include the location, the background and objectives of the trial, methods, implementation plan and references used. Explanations and hints are found in the full document. Trainees are requested to review each section of the checklist carefully and provide feedback on clarity and understanding of the exercise. During the last day of the workshops, participants complete the designs and then comes the important part of presenting them to farmers and getting reactions, a reality check. Do farmers see these trials as interesting, relevant, useful and practical? Are they interested in being part of the team implementing the trials? You need to invest time in making sure that these farmers fully understand the design and what they are getting involved in. This communication about the design has to cover three areas. First, the overall aim of the experiment. Second, understanding how the design works, its logical basis and how it will provide information needed. Some of this might be obvious, but it's worth making it explicit, as other interpretations by farmers are possible. There are complex ideas here, but there's no reason why farmers shouldn't understand them if you take the time to explain carefully. And if they don't understand them, it's likely they will not carry out the trial as intended. Third, there are details such as the space needed for the trial, who does what, where inputs will be coming from, the ownership of the products coming out of the experiment, how to join and leave the activity, and how the results will be compiled and shared with the farmer community. Communicating these ideas requires a social capital built up between farmers and researchers during the workshop. Thank you.